All right, good afternoon. Why don't we go ahead and get started? My name is Chad Lefteris. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of UCI Health, and it's a real pleasure to be with you now this afternoon at 12.01. Um, and thank you to so many of you who have joined us. Looks like over 90 uh, and climbing. So thank you very much. I see many faces that I recognize, and thanks for those of you who can, at a place where you can turn on your camera as well. Uh, on behalf of the What Matters to Me and Why Organizing Committee, the Advisory Council on Campus, Climate, Culture, and Inclusion, the UCI School of Medicine, and UCI Health, it is our great pleasure to welcome you to another What Matters to Me and Why talk. As staff, faculty, residents, physicians, fellows, and students, we spend so much of our time here with exams or lectures, the clinical practice, or, and many, many other topics, doing the things that are required to keep the broader university and UCI Health running so smoothly. What matters to me and why is a chance to stop for a moment and break from the usual frenetic activities. With these talks, we have the opportunity to hear from people who shape UCI through their daily activities. Speakers give a short informal talk, followed by ample time for questions and discussion, and there really is no prescribed topic. Speakers are asked to simply answer the question, what matters to you and why, authentically and frankly, and take it wherever it goes from there. The series provides a forum for speakers to talk about values, beliefs, and motivations, and perhaps to share how they've been shaped by their personal experiences, including both the highs and lows encountered along the way. The hope is to strengthen bonds between faculty, students, and staff who discover, teach, and heal here, and celebrate both the diversity of this community and the commonalities that bind us together. Because this series attracts an audience from all over UCI, it is our tradition to give you a minute to introduce yourselves to your neighbors. Now that we're in the Zoom era, we'll use the magic of breakout rooms to split you into smaller groups, literally for 60 seconds, say hello, and then get you back for the main event. So let's go ahead and break us away, the magic of Zoom. Welcome back, everybody. I, I certainly hope you enjoy getting to know your virtual neighbors. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Stamus, Dean of the UCI School of Medicine. Following a successful campus program that began in 2012, so a full decade ago, we kicked off the What Matters to Me and Why at UCI Health Series in 2019. All of our talks, including this one, are filmed, and you can find previous videos on the What Matters to Me and Why website if you missed them. In addition, you'll receive a survey after the event. We take feedback, particularly suggestions for future speakers, very seriously, so please fill and complete and submit it so we can have your feedback on this and future events. It really is important to us that we hear from a diverse perspective of voices for this series. And this opportunity is welcome to anyone at any level or area. It's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, and for you to welcome Dr. Leslie Thompson. Leslie Thompson, uh, PhD, is a Donald Bren and Chancellor's Professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Human Behavior and Neurobiology and Behavior at UCI. Uh, those are two different schools, by the way, in case you weren't aware of that. One is in the School of Medicine and one is in the School of Biological Sciences. So she splits her uh, appointment between the two schools, which is really a great way to bridge the gap that occasionally exists between the schools. Dr. Thompson has studied Huntington's disease, for which she has a great passion for most of her career, and was a member of the International Consortium that identified the causative gene for Huntington, Huntington's disease in 1993. She also co-identified the mutation causing achondroplasia, the most common genetic form of short-limbed dwarfism in 1994. Since that time, the Thompson Laboratory has been actively engaged in investigating the fundamental molecular and cellular events that underlie how the mutant Huntington disease gene causes degeneration of specific brain cell populations to induce motor and cognitive decline and premature death of patients with the ultimate goal of course, to develop new treatments. So really translational and impact, including stem cell based treatments. The laboratory also focuses on understanding mechanisms that underlie amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and more recently X-linked dystonia Parkinsonism with the goal of developing personalized treatment strategies for these diseases. The research that she does in the neurosciences benefits from the integrated use of patient stem cells and mouse models of disease together with the studies of RNA biology protein quality control, and network-based bioinformatics. Further, through funding by CIRM, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, 
the Thompson Lab is working to develop a stem cell-based therapy for Huntington's disease. Dr. Thompson is a member of the Huntington Disease Care Scientific Advisory Board, the Packard Center Scientific Advisory Board. She's chair of the Huntington's Disease Society of America uh, Scientific Advisory Board, co-chair of the Hereditary Disease Foundation Scientific Advisory Board, and is founding co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Huntington's Disease. Needless to say, she is at the forefront of, uh, of study and treatment of this disease. She is the PI of the omics core of the ANSWER ALS program, which is a precision medicine approach to understand sporadic ALS in over 1,000 ALS subjects. She's also co-director, more locally, um, of the Precision Health Through Artificial Intelligence Academic Initiative at UCI that seeks to improve health and advanced treatments through AI and data-driven technologies. That's a mouthful, uh, but I promise you, she's not going to give us a scientific talk, uh, which I would welcome, but uh, is not what this series is about. So, Leslie, uh, Dr. Thompson, please uh, uh, share your um, what matters to me and why with us. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, thank you for the organizers for this amazing invitation and the honor to speak in this series. Um, I went back and Listen to some of the tapes of previous speakers and uh, uh, KV and Hal Stern and others. And I think Hal nailed it with the, it was easy to say yes. And then when you think about it, it's really hard <laughs> and a little terrifying. So um, I am going to get into really some of the things that um, guided my path and, and the work that we've been doing and not from a science perspective, but from a very personal perspective and the highs and lows to some degree, the challenges, but the opportunities and joys that's gone along with it. So I'll share my screen. I thought a lot about, you know, kind of what, what matters to me and over the last several weeks. And I think it comes down to the interrelatedness that we have with people, the interrelatedness um, between individuals in our families, in our work, in our society, and, and for me um, to do something with my life that maybe is meaningful, that will do some good. Um, I've had the benefit of having incredible mentors over the years and, and people who've helped guide me. And so it matters to me to sort of pay that forward and also be a, a good mentor. And um, a little bit of uh, overcoming fear in, in terms of, whether it's to take on some new area of research or when things happen in life where your path changes to sort of embrace that and, and, and try to overcome it and, and seize these opportunities. So um, I think that's really this, this interrelatedness is really what's prime for me, the connections between people. And uh, I just thought I'd start with this for a second. This is Woody Guthrie. This land is your land, and this land is my land. From the California to the New York Island. So Woody Guthrie had Huntington's disease, passed away from Huntington's disease. And this is part of the description, the original description of Huntington's, that it's an heirloom from generations way back. So it's really... It's a disease of families. It's a disease that connects our communities, um, our HD communities, our research communities, our families. It certainly has affected my family from uh, having been um, so devoted to the research around it. And so it, it, it kind of does reflect this interrelatedness between people that matters so much to me. Uh, and so what I thought I'd do is, is go back um, sort of start with the beginnings for me. And uh, this is a picture of my mom. Uh, she is one, an identical twin. It's hard to tell sometimes which one is her, but this is her right here, her sister. She's one of nine children, um, born to a very large Italian family, uh, grew up in Newark, New Jersey. This is a, a number of her sisters. This is her again, and her mom, the matriarch. Her parents came from Sicily through Ellis Island to New Jersey. And I love this family. I, it, it, I could listen to them talk 
with their hands and all talking at once forever. And it, it really, if you think Moonstruck, the movie, you kind of get a sense of what this family was like. Um, and my mom, you know, they, she overcame a lot of challenges in her own life. She um, had to leave school at 16 and work. She still got her high school degree. And she valued education highly. She taught my sister and I that value, those values throughout our life. And she um, even went back to school when we were young. She started taking college classes and ultimately graduated from UCSD. We even got to take a class together at UCSD. So she was always a big influence on me. Um, this is my, a picture of my dad here when he was young and his mom. He actually grew up in an orphanage outside of Chicago um, yeah, because his dad committed suicide when he was very young. And his mother couldn't afford to take care of the three boys, and she had the raise the their sister. But the three boys grew up in this orphanage. And when he was a teenager, he ran away from the orphanage, found some money in the street, and hooked a ride a train to Chicago, and and really became a self made man, so to speak. He was very charming. He started out selling silk hosiery to secretaries, going desk to desk around, and ended up back in New York. Um, here he is on, he is, was in the armed services, uh, in the horseback um, services. And here he is with my mom, who he met in New York when he was division manager for Encyclopedia Britannica. And they had a whirlwind romance of married three months after they met. They moved around quite a bit, um, and, but we ended up in Wisconsin. And that was my formative childhood years. At that time, I thought I was going to become a musician. I played flute, I took lessons with the uh, first chair of the Milwaukee Symphony, also loved science. I had a chemistry set and microscope that I used in the basement. That was kind of my, my enjoyment. I just loved that. Um, but then when I was 13 years old, we, my parents decided to move to Mexico, to Guadalajara, Mexico. And um, that was one of those changes in my path, uh, very significant change in my path. This is, this is down in, with my sister in Mexico, um, where I became very interested in health and equity and culture. And really, it, it completely changed the path that I took. I decided that I, I loved biology, I loved science, and I wanted to do something that would make a difference to people's health. Um, because, you know, you saw so many different communicable diseases down there, so many, so much inequity. Um, and, and so that, that had a big effect on me. Um, we then moved from Mexico when I was senior in high school back up to San Diego and went to college at UC so that I could get residency for college, went to college at UC San Diego. And <clears throat> during that time, again, um, trying to decide what I wanted to do. Did I want to go to medical school? Did I want to get a PhD or go into research? And during that time, I actually did a, a quarter abroad in, in um, Africa, in Sierra Leone, Africa, and did epidemiology research there while I was there. Um, and that, that was a, another pivotal experience where I, I thought about joining the Peace Corps. I wanted to work on malaria. We were in these small bush villages where they had the Catholic nuns run the hospital and you saw cases of malaria and schistosomiasis and onchocerciasis and all these disorders of third world countries. And the, the again, the health inequities that, that came up from that. Um, it also taught me a valuable lesson about imposter syndrome during that time. I think many of us have that where, you know, what am I doing here? I'm a bio major and all these people are sociology majors who are here and they know what they're talking about and they sound so smart and they, they, they work all together on, on the cultural aspects of this. But I learned a lesson there from the standpoint that one of the individuals, he decided to call a town hall in this small remote village in Africa, said, okay, at noon, we're all gonna meet and go through all this. Well, of course, nobody showed up. They were all in the field. They had their own things they were doing. And it, and it was the other bio major and I who really connected with the people, with the, the villagers, with the people at the hospitals, and, and understood the diseases that they were working on, um, that they were living through. So it taught, me, it taught me something about that, that I keep learning as I go along, that, that sometimes you, 
you know, maybe you're doing okay, even if it feels sometimes like you shouldn't be where you are. <laughs> um, so then came back to, after UCSD, got married, came up to UCI. My husband was a, a medical student here at UCI. And that was the start of my path here. I uh, had my daughter, Jennifer. Um, I started as a technician here for a number of years in the Department of Pathology, had my daughter, and then um, decided I wanted to go back to graduate school. I really loved science, wanted to do things that I um, follow that path and had my son, Christopher, uh, in graduate school here. Um, when I was technician in, in pathology, I remember giving a lot of opportunity to, to um, be fairly independent and gave a talk at Asilomar one year and um, very naive, terrified to do this among all these people like Barbara Hamkello being there and people like that. And uh, uh, during the talk said something like, you know, showing a gel and saying, but if anybody need, wants to see it, I have the gel back in my room. And after all the laughter died down and realized what I'd said, kept going, but you know, you just, you learn as you go. <laughs> uh, and then I, so I started graduate school. I was in the master's program here and decided I'd like to pursue a PhD. And I was so excited when I got into the PhD program here um, and uh, told my family about it. My father-in-law at the time said, uh, so who's going to take care of the baby? And it was like such a big hit, you know, and emotionally and, and the start of all those struggles that I think many of us have as parents where I'm not doing enough for the kids. I'm not doing enough at, at work and, and all those struggles that you go through throughout, throughout their childhood. Um, but kept going. And this was graduate school. This is Joan Steffen, who um, met when I was a technician in pathology, and we've been partners in crime ever since, and in uh, Lee McAllister's Hens Lab, and have been working together ever since. Our paths diverged for a while, and then we came back together and have been working on Huntington's disease together um, as partners in the lab for a very long time. And uh, this is Lee McAllister Hen, who was my mentor in graduate school, worked on yeast genetics. Uh, Ralph Bradshaw, who was the chair of biological chemistry at the time. Here's the department at that point in time. And she, she was the first of, of many of these mentors who um, I was pregnant. I had, we had a baby in graduate school. There was no such thing as maternity leave for graduate students at that time. And she just said, here, take three months have the baby, have this time. And, and really that made a huge difference for me and taught me something. And I, I strive to do that in my own lab to encourage women with children, moms who may need to even work part-time, but just to provide those opportunities for people like she did for me. And, and same with Ralph. He, he was, uh, we worked together following the discovery of the chondrochondritis gene on um, signal transduction. And, and he was also, has always been an incredible mentor for me um, every step of the way. And at that time when I was in graduate school, I took a class that really changed the course of my life. And this was with John Wasmuth shown here on the right. Um, he was a faculty member in biochem and he, um, he taught a class on human genetics and genomics. And it was the time when the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy gene had just been identified. The Huntington's gene was mapped to a chromosome. It was the most exciting thing I'd ever heard in my whole life about all these disorders and how you could track the genetics and identify these disease genes. So I asked him and uh, joined his lab as a postdoctoral fellow. And this also started a path for me of collaborative research. So I became um, part of this Huntington's Disease Collaborative Research Group. Uh, this is Nancy Wexler, who's I will get into more, who's been a pivotal part of my life. Um, she really guided this collaboration, um, would have us meet, would encourage people to just talk about their newest research, would sometimes, you know, facilitate phone calls between collaborators to make things work. And this is uh, one of the perks was getting to go to Isla Mirada, Florida uh, once a year for one of our meetings. We'd have them periodically with the whole consortium. That's me here, Francis Collins, David Hausman, who's been a mentor and friend ever since, 
Jim Gasella, a number of others that we still to this day all work together, um, collaborate. They, they've all been incredible colleagues and, and friends. Um, so this was a very exciting time finding the counterplasia gene. I can remember being in the lab in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. and seeing this sequence with my colleague Rita Shang and just being so excited. This, this is what research is all about. This is incredible. And a year later, um, John committed suicide. So I was a senior postdoc in the lab at the time. He had bipolar disorder. And so at the height of his career, after all these incredible, exciting uh, research thing, um, research work that he'd done, it, it just overtook him. And it was a really, really devastating time. Um, we had to, another senior postdoc and I, had to help students graduate. We had to figure out what to do with grants. We had to, we were just devastated by the loss of our friend and mentor. And um, people came from all over the world to be at his memorial service here. Uh, Francis came, Nancy came, uh, and, and a woman named Kay Jameson even came and met with the lab. She was a, a um, she's in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA at the time, and then Johns Hopkins now, who had suffered from bipolar disorder, wrote a book called Unquiet Mind. She came and met with the whole lab at that time and really helped us kind of get through this. And the people at UCI were unbelievable. Um, Stu Arfin was the chair at the time. I remember sitting outside with him just sobbing and him providing encouragement. Moira Smith, Jay Gargas, you know, Suzanne Samar, just all these people that were there, and I think this is so such a big part of UCI is this collegiality, this um, collaborative spirit, this this wanting to help people here. And so, it this is you know one of my families is, is this UCI environment. So I went up to um, after John died. I was a little lost, not sure what I was going to do. You know, was I going to go the route of becoming you know, a full-time professor, I was a postdoc at the time, um, and, or was I not going to do that? I mean, I had two young children, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I went up to a book signing in Los Angeles shortly after John died, um, written for a book called Mapping Fate by Alice Wexler, who's Nancy Wexler's sister. Nancy's mom died of Huntington's disease. Her dad started the Hereditary Disease Foundation, She's a researcher in and of herself. She worked at NIH for many years. And she, I told her at the book signing, you know, I've always wanted to go to Venezuela. Um, Venezuela has this large population of Huntington's disease patients. Um, and she said, okay, come. So I went that March, uh, a couple months later and, and went there for several different years. And again, this was a turning point in life where if I hadn't been committed to Huntington's disease before, I certainly was there. There's hundreds of individuals with Huntington's and really saw the, how devastating it is for families. This is a disease that strikes in midlife. It robs you of your ability to take care of your family, to work, psychiatric disturbances, um, you know, movement disorder, and it it progresses over a period of 15, 20 years, and there's absolutely nothing you can do to change the course of disease. This little girl on the left had juvenile Huntington's disease, uh, another individual with HD in these families, just 13 people would be at risk or affected with Huntington's. This is Anne Young, who uh, was the first female chair of neurology at Mass General, would go down there every year. Um, Nancy, in the, and these are some of the villages we would go meet with people who just loved her. They knew she had it in her family. They understood she was trying to help them. And this was really um, transformational for me. And even to this day, so we work really hard on this disease it's, and, and have done so for many, many years. Um, I have a picture of Nancy in my office framed with a, a child in Venezuela with Huntington's. And then these uh, three wonderful young people who um, are the children of Francis Saldana, who started a HD care organizational here at UCI for um, sort of support funding for research. She had 
Her husband died of Huntington's disease and all three of her children have now passed away from juvenile onset Huntington's disease. So I keep these pictures in my office as a reminder of why I do what matters to me um, and, and really keep you going because research is a lot of challenges. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and, and, you know, during this time, it was really the joys of building a lab, working with Joan very closely to do this and um, experiencing mentorship, being able to help people's careers, the challenges of getting funding, raising children during that time, um, and jumping at all the different opportunities, forming new consortia, an IPS consortia for Huntington's disease, the answer ALS uh, work, and, and the, the trials and the joys. Um, during this time, uh, Joan and I had this wonderful paper in Nature that was so exciting to us. But at the same time, I was going through a really devastating divorce and my daughter was very ill. Um, again, Nancy came to the rescue and helped me find care for her and helped me find the financial support to do that. Um, so there's always these highs and lows. There's challenges uh, with, with the work and, um, and with your personal life. And you, you just keep going. You, as I've gotten older, I've realized that each of these is part of the path that things, great things are going to come from it. Things you don't expect to come out of it. Friendships you don't expect to form. Um, people that were there for me, Peter Donovan, Frank LaFerla, Joan, you know, these people that are always, that are always there as um, colleagues and mentors. And the lab, the, the people in the lab are really what it brings joy. And it's so much fun to watch them all develop and people that have been leaders and come into their own of, of being mentors as well, like um, Jack Reedling and Charlie and Ryan here, um, a group of graduate students. We, we have a lot of women in the lab and, and really try to support their path and help students find what, what's, what their passion is, what matters to them, what's their niche that they'd like to pursue and go along in their career. And then, of course, what matters to me is my family um, tremendously. I, uh, my daughter that you saw, my son in the earlier pictures, and I got to meet the love of my life, Michael, who um, was introduced by a mutual friend and uh, his kids and all these little ones that I, I get to be with. Um, and he told me once when we first met that with me, you can be anything you want to be. And he's totally lived up to that and been an incredible support um, every step of the way. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and you get to do things like watch your daughter ride on a, the tip of a pilot whale or back of a dolphin in her work at SeaWorld. And so that it's been really a joyful path, even with all these challenges, but it's not a straight path, certainly. And this was uh, during a particular difficult time, a friend of mine and I went to Hawaii and stumbled upon this beautiful light, this just incredible thing. And to me, kind of represents the, the, the joy and the light that you do find as you go through some of the challenges and the opportunities that present itself. Um, now we're working on, you know, trying to bridge uh, interrelationships across campus to achieve precision health in um, and health equity in our communities and, and provide even better health care at UCI. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk and um, really appreciate it. Take any questions. Wow, um, what an incredible uh, story, uh, Dr. Thompson. Thank you um, for being willing to share with us such um, intimate moments in your life, but also uh, many painful moments in your life. I, you know, I think uh, uh, just really touched by the way you um, framed them and talked about them. So thank you for that. And thank you also for all your contributions to the School of Medicine and the broader campus of UCI and, of course, the healthcare enterprise, particularly with the work that you, you're doing now on the Precision Health Initiative, um, has great promise to have uh, tremendous translational impact on, on patient outcome and on health equity, as you said. So thank you so much. Uh, 
Thanks so much for sharing what matters to you and why. At this time, we'd like to open up to questions from the audience to, to speak. You can um, chat or you can raise your virtual hand on Zoom and we will uh, call out to you. If you do the chat, I will read the questions uh, to the speaker. You can put your name or if you prefer to be anonymous, just put uh, anonymous. We welcome uh, any and all questions or comments. So thank you very much for participating in the session. And um, again, we're very grateful for Dr. Thompson. Uh, what is indeed, uh, like, as you said, a very challenging topic to cover. All right, we're gonna be a pregnant pause here. Again, UCI is just such a great place. I've really valued my time here. Leslie? Yes, Peter. Uh, I feel I should ask a question. Please. <laughs> Peter uh, Donovan, go ahead. Uh, that was a really inspiring talk, Leslie, and very moving as well. And um, as I listened to it, it seems like you went through some really difficult uh, times in your life. And how much did, at different times, you kind of alluded to this quite often, the kind of familial aspects of both your home life and your work life and your friendships outside of work get you through? For example, when you were going through, you know, divorce, did you lean into the lab and when maybe things were difficult in the lab, vice versa, and how did you kind of do that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Peter. Um, absolutely. Both, both ways. When things were tough in the lab and I didn't know how I was going to pay people <laughs> or keep research going. Um, absolutely family at home were there. My, my kids have been amazing. They, you know, all those times that they tease me about being the last one to be picked up at daycare, they also say, we really respect what you've done, mom, and we're so proud of you, you know? And so there's always that balance. And, and certainly the lab, every step of the way, people in the lab have been such great friends, support, you know, when things were tough personally and they'd have to pick up the slack sometimes. Right. And they were always there. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you. I, hi, Dr. Thompson. I don't think we know each other, but uh, I went to UCSD at some point, maybe we intersected down there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just, I just love what you had to share. I just, I, I sense a, a heroism in you and I just love that you want to, share that with other, particularly young women uh, in the field of science. But my question is really maybe a bit tongue in cheek. Have you had a chance to revisit that conversation with your previous father-in-law and uh, maybe point out that things have worked out really well for you and for yeah. you? Yeah, <laughs> he, he unfortunately passed away a number of years ago, but he, he was, actually came to my thesis defense and was so excited about it. And that's a good point. I should have mentioned that they were incredibly supportive in the end. And it was a good question. It wasn't really a bad question, right? Who is going to take care of the baby? <laughs> he asked a question you hadn't thought of yet. Yeah, or maybe hadn't acknowledged. <laughs> I, I particularly want to thank you for sharing the, uh, you know, the feelings of imposter syndrome, because I think all of us have those, but, but they oh, really yeah. can sometimes really trip us up and not allow us to move forward. And so I think it's helpful to know that that's a common feeling. In fact, it might Very. be universal, quite frankly, for people who are high achievers, right? Uh, yeah. Because, you know, it is, you, you, you look around and you think, I'm not any different than the other people here, but why am I in this, you know, position, et cetera. So I think it's oh, very, always. very helpful to, 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 to share that with, uh, with all of us. So, Ed Manuki. Hi, Ed. Yeah, hey, Leslie. Thank you so much for that. Um, I learned a lot, <laughs> um, which, um, and um, just, just thank you for being willing to share the story. Um, yeah, the imposter syndrome, just to follow up on that, I think we all know people that we look up to, like you, Leslie, um, and saying, wow, th these people are doing so much better than I'm doing. And what am I not doing right? Uh, you know, it, it's, there's always people doing something that you admire. Um, and and uh, so we do all feel that, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, sort of, kind of hearing, hearing your story and how much you've persevered through all of this and are still such a positive um, role model and influence for so many of us. 
Um, and as you said, you know, graduate students, um, I, I was curious when you advise your graduate students, you know, who are kind of going through um, not the same, but maybe related challenges and thinking about a career and moving forward. I, um, I, I know you have a lot of positive um, encouragement that you give to them. I'm, I was curious, maybe more, what are the things that you tell your advisees to watch out for or to um, to have, you know, their eyes wide open about? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's so individual with each of the students, right? It's, it's trying to provide, so let's say they, so many of our students, I think right now are discouraged about going into academia. They're, they feel like it's too hard. You know, I've had people tell me, you work too hard. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, but, um, but that, you know, try and encourage them not to give up on that and then provide opportunities for them to get training, go to other labs, you know, experience it, see what they think, right? You know, if they want to do an internship at a company, see what it's really like. So it, maybe rather than trying to tell them things to avoid or pitfalls, which we do talk about, but is more to provide the resources to explore and, and figure out what works for them. Because we're all so different, right? What we want to do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, before I call on Dr. Joshi, who has her hand raised, I'm going to uh, read one from the chat. Uh, this is from Marguerite Klum. Thank you, Marguerite. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk, Dr. Thompson. I'm curious to hear how grief has impacted your journey and how has it affected your mentoring style? Yeah, it definitely has. Um, I think it's provided certainly empathy for what people are going through, um, perspective. Uh, and, and when somebody else is going through something to try to listen, you know, to try to, to be there. Cause I, there's been so many times when somebody said, well, you don't have it as bad as this person, right. Or this situation, but that doesn't really help. <laughs> you just need somebody to listen. And, and, um, but it, I, I think it's made me even more committed to the research we've done to the, to the path to, yeah, it definitely has impacted empathy and perspective, I guess. Thank you. Dr. Joshi, our uh, interim chair of psychiatry. Hi. Hi, Leslie. That was just marvelous. It really was. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, and connecting all the dots in your life professionally and personally as well. And, and clearly, you know, all uh, just piggybacking on the previous question, you've had, um, you know, folks, your colleagues with mental illness and, um, uh, you know, even in the family. And I was just wondering what you have noticed in terms of recognizing, um, yeah. you know, mental illness and psychological issues in the last three decades. Because I just want to relate to, uh, relay, uh, you know, to the audience, what happened with Kay Jamison? Yes. So, you know, what happened was she was at Hopkins at the time. I was a very junior, I was a resident at the time. And she did not disclose that she had bipolar disorder. Wow. And when she did, she was asked not to see patients anymore. Oh, gosh. And this decision came from the dean's office at the time. Yeah. And so that's when she, at, and this is, we are talking about the early 80s, is when she went full time into writing and research because she was not allowed to see patients because she had disclosed right. Right. that she herself had mental illness. So um, I just thought, you know, yeah. um, to put a little um, uh, different um, uh, lens to that. Yeah. And I think that was so amazing that she came down and met with us. I, I will never, ever forget that, yeah. that yeah. she did that. And, and even for John, it was so hidden at that time. The whole premise of him having bipolar mm -hmm. disorder was very hidden, you know, and he struggled with it and he put on a good face and it, it just, it wasn't just talked about. And mm -hmm. I keep thinking of where he could be now, you know, he has, he had just had this young grandchild when that happened. And his wife, I talked to his wife and his, his wife, I did just killed me. His wife recently had told me, you know, John would be so proud of you. Uh -huh. and just thinking about yeah. him being here, had that maybe not been so hidden. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. It's, a, it's a, an extra burden that people have to carry, right? I mean, it, yeah. it's bad enough you have this disease and, and it is a, an illness that we can treat, uh, but then to have to keep it hidden or, or secret or, yeah. you know, God forbid, be uh, ostracized by a dean. Holy cow. Watch out Holy for the cow. dean. Holy cow. And, and it's really very similar to Huntington's, too. I mean, Huntington's yeah. has classically yeah. been a disease that families keep hidden also. Yeah. Don't talk yeah. about it. Yeah. And it's being becoming more open, I think, just like mental illness, too. Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, we really, let's see, we have one more. Nope. Uh, so I think we... Um, I've gotten some great, great uh, comments and great questions. I want to, uh, before I uh, close up, I want to just say, uh, Leslie, you need to get together with David about UCSD and whether you guys had any past across. But <laughs> That's right. I need, I need to talk to you next time we see each other about Ala Murata. I spent yeah. a lot of time there uh, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, early that was 90s. A big uh, perk, having a so, meeting, going water skiing. <laughs> yeah, that South Florida life is nice. So uh, what an incredible story. Again, uh, thank you for your insightful words and for being our featured speaker today. I'd also once again like to thank the What Matters to Me and Why Organizing Committee and the Advisory Council on Campus Climate, Culture, and Inclusion. Please do take the previously mentioned survey about this event. We'd love your honest feedback, particularly including future speaker suggestions. Again, thank you all for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate it. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you.